My name is Caitlin Kaluja, and I am the marketing manager here at Shipple. I work with Shipple and uh, the creators of Tendency. And this is auditing your Tendency website. So the idea is that it is checkups, analytics, benchmark, sort of. You, my Our intent is that if your site has been live for a little while, what are some things that you need to kind of keep an eye on and keep checking up on to make sure that it's staying up to date and you're sort of um, – your, your, some maintenance things as your site, because your site should be kind of a living, breathing thing. It should be constantly changing. You should be constantly adding content to it. So kind of as you do those things, naturally, what are some checklists that you need to make sure that that things stay sort of clean and, um, and organized in, in a good fashion? Um, I went ahead and muted everyone so that we don't get feedback from um, from your microphone. So if you have a question or if I say, now I'm clicking to the next slide and you don't see that click happen right away, or if you have audio issues or anything like that, just type in the chat box in your GoToMeeting window. So um, if you could just do one more check for me, if you can hear me okay, can somebody just type yes or okay in the chat box just so I can, just so I can make sure that everything is... Okay, cool. Thanks, Evan. Um, I'm also uh, recording this session, so I'll send you a video of that as well. So you'll have some sort of documentation and we'll post the slides so you have the slides as well. There are a lot, as I mentioned, it's a lot of checkups and benchmarks and things like that. So we're linking to a lot of external resources. So that way you don't have to remember and write everything down. You can, you know, you'll have a copy of it. So... The question of the hour is, my website is live, now what? And this is actually, when we talk to current clients, this is the number one question that we get asked is, okay, my website is live, I love it, now now what do I do? So today we're going to cover checkups and checklists, content and keywords, some analytics benchmarks, uh, we'll talk about mobile, and then we'll talk specifically about a couple of tendency features that you may not be using yet. Also, I have a couple of kind of sneak peeks of things that are rolling out shortly to, to share with you guys. So I mentioned my name is Caitlin Kalusia, and you should be seeing a slide with a picture of me on it. If you're not, let me know. Um, I am... Like I mentioned, I run the marketing team for Tendency and for Shipple. I spent uh, about a year and a half running the search engine marketing team here at Shipple. So I am very, I guess, well-versed in analytics. And so we're going to talk a lot about Google Analytics and kind of how to make, how to review your site there and make decisions about that data. Um, I also spent two years as a project manager before that. So I've sort of been in a lot of different departments in Shipple, seen a lot of parts of the business. So hopefully I can help give kind of a well-rounded um, approach. So let's start with some checkups and checklists. So this is our annual homepage audit, and this is actually based on a blog post on blog.shipple.com, and you'll see the link there, slash 2013 homepage audit. And this is something that we like to look at. I recommend looking at your homepage at least once a year and sort of stepping back. When you first, when your site first went live, there were reasons for probably all of the elements on your homepage. There were, you know, there were things that were placed in certain ways on purpose. But as, again, as your site grows and changes and you add content and your objectives as a as a nonprofit or as an organization or as a company change, it's important to kind of step back and look at your homepage and make sure that it still reflects everything that you want it to. So here is my short checklist. And if you want to read more about this, again, the blog post on shipple.com, on blog.shipple.com has more, even more details about this. Um, the first is squint test. So we're going to go through these kind of kind of one by one. So the squint test means when you're looking at your site for the very first time, if somebody has never heard about you or they don't know who you are, they've stumbled across your site, can they tell what you do? And it should be sort of obvious. Sometimes that is an image that shows your product or your services or um, I think T-Rex and they actually just redesigned their website so it doesn't look quite like this anymore. I think they do a good job of saying they put their services right at the top. You know exactly what they do. You know exactly where they are. They have their kind of what and where right at the top. You know where they're located. Um, I think that the hardest thing is sometimes, especially for organizations that maybe your industry is kind of complex or maybe you're a nonprofit who serves kind of a different a different niche Um sort of letting people know exactly who you are. So at a glance, your homepage, should people should be able to tell 
what you do, kind of who you are, just a little bit about you in general. The next item on our checklist is the headline. Um, the headline is part of our web marketing fundamental process that in all of our websites, we think about the headline. The headline is the most important part of a website in that people on the web respond they read very quickly and they they have you have just a few seconds to make a first impression. So you want to make sure that that headline really grabs them. Um, and so if you haven't taken a look at your headline in a while, that's a good place to kind of look and say, does that still mirror what our mission is? Does that still make sense? Is it still compelling? There are three types of headlines. The first is benefit headlines, and that essentially tells tells your visitor what benefit you're going to give them. Um, the other is news headlines, which shares, you know, a little bit of news. And then the third is curiosity headlines. So those can be something either kind of quirky or interesting, or um, we tend to not put curiosity headlines on maybe a homepage, but maybe like on a landing page or a specific product page or kind of a, a particular campaign where you're trying to be kind of fun and, and interesting curiosity headlines. And those tend to kind of start with a question or there's something kind of kind of quirky and interesting. Um, my recommendation, if you are thinking about revisiting your headline, is to brainstorm and then test, test, test. When we create new headlines internally, a lot of times it's not uncommon for us to create a list of 300 headlines that we're going to pick from. And essentially, what we'll do is have everyone on the team brainstorm as many as they can possibly think of and then sort of narrow it down from there. So don't limit yourself. Really, that's a good place to start is just think about any kind of, you know, what what is that grabbing thing that's going to explain who you are and get someone to read more. Also, you can test most of these headlines that you see are in text, so it's something that you have the ability to change and update and kind of play with. So test different things, um, even if it's testing with your, have some colleagues gather around a circle and show them three choices and see which ones they pick. You know, do some kind of testing on your headline. Here's some more headline resources. I also wanted uh, to mention that you have your headline on your homepage, but I like to think in a lot of our websites, we have what we call stories rotators, which are big images and headlines that rotate through. So you get to a homepage and you see maybe a big image that showcases one program, and then it transitions to a big image that showcases another program. So think of each story title. A lot of times um, on your homepage, that is the biggest text. This is from the Houston Art Car Parade, and they do a great job of their homepage. It has a big rotator with lots of different um, images of the cars, and they treat each one kind of like its own separate headline, which I think is important. Um, some resources for this, there is this, as I mentioned, Shibble.com, our article within our web marketing fundamental fundamentals series, Your Website Needs a Strong Marketing Headline. That's a great resource. Um, I also am a big fan of Copyblogger. Copyblogger.com has a lot of web content resources, and they have a great article on writing magnetic headlines as well. So if you need kind of inspiration, that's a good place to start. And then just a quick note on creating headlines that are sticky. This book is called Made to Stick by Chip Heath and Dan Heath, and it's a great book on sort of why some ideas stick and why some ideas stick with people and people really remember them and kind of tips for creating content that really sticks with people. And this is their simple-ish algorithm on creating that sticky content. So sticky content is simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and then always remember that story sell. So. So the next item on our homepage checklist, so remember we're going through our homepage and kind of checking off the list of, of how it's performing. The, the next is imagery. So when you're thinking about the imagery of your homepage, um, you wanna make sure that it is, it's up to date, it's modern, it's imagery that you, you know, it's current. Um, if you are, for instance, we, we do a lot of, we're technology based. And so if we have to make sure that the, you know, the screenshots on our homepage are up to date and the most, the most modern, is it consistent with all of the other imagery you're using across all of your other marketing campaigns? Um, does it show real people? I think one of the things that when we build a website for the first time, sometimes we'll use stock photography, which stock photography is great and has its place, but, um, and 
for those of you who aren't familiar with stock photography, essentially that is you can go online and purchase images that other people have created and then um, use them kind of however you want because you've purchased the license for them. So especially on some of our medical websites, we'll have sort of a generic picture of doctors or a generic picture of nurses. And I think people can spot stock photography a mile away. So as much as you can as much as you can use images of real people and show your real, I love this camp for all example. They do camp, they do camps for, um, for kids with disabilities and, and challenges in their own lives. And I think showing the real kids that they really help, you can tell right away that those are real kids. Um, also, does it build credibility? The example on the bottom right is the YMCA. When they did their rebranding a few years ago, they had very specific branding requirements. So you'll see the color palettes, you'll see the font example, you'll see things like even in those images in the middle, they had specific image types that they want and that the, the YMCA National wants all of the branches of the YMCA to have the same look and feel. And so I think it's really having that consistent branding, it really does build credibility within your own organization, especially if you are part of a larger organization. Uh, keeping that in mind in your imagery, making sure everything is consistent and credible and up to date and kind of fits what you're doing now. So the next item on our homepage checklist is rich media and dynamic content. This is a screenshot of Susan G. Komen uh, Houston, and they do a fantastic job. Their homepage has dynamic content all over the place. They're feeding in events and videos and news and photos. And this is one that all of these are tendency modules that they're adding news in one place and it's automatically feeding all over the site. So are you making use of that dynamic content? Are you making use of rich media? Are you showing off these photos and videos and using kind of the tools that you have in Tendency? The next item on our homepage checklist is the navigation. And navigation is another thing that typically, similar to the homepage, when a site first, very first goes live and we create the website, we spend a lot of our team spends a lot of time on the navigation and kind of going through what makes sense. But as a site grows and adds, you add more content and maybe your priorities change a little bit or your programs are, you know, have slightly different names or, you know, whatever happens, your navigation is something you should look at at least once a year, if not once every, you know, six months or so and kind of scrutinize and try to figure out, is that the way that this needs to be? The navigation is something I think that people people get kind of stuck and think that it's set in stone when really it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. You have the ability to, to make revisions if you need to. So when you're looking at your navigation, here are a couple of, here's my mini, mini checklist within our bullet. Um, what is the goal of your website? As always, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Is that clear? Is, you know, if you want people to contact you, is the contact button super clear? Um, if you want people to learn about your programs, is it really obvious where those, you know, where those programs are? You want to use specific, concise labels. So you'll see the screenshot at the top. You kind of want to stay away from what we do, who we are, our services. Those don't really mean anything to anyone else. Um, a better example is down at the bottom, you'll see the Hope and Healing Center. They have their programs specifically listed out. So the first item is family crisis prevention. The second item is healthy family system. So it shows exactly what they do instead of just saying, you know, kind of, our services. Um, you want to keep it to about seven items, uh, much more than that, and you start to get a little, it starts to get a little overwhelming, and we do cheat a little bit, and we'll put a utility nav, so that's what this green bar that ha that is on top of the navigation, that's called a utility navigation, and essentially what that is is kind of smaller, secondary, a secondary navigation, so people can get to the about your you know like your contact form or your directions or things that maybe aren't as important to go in the main navigation but you really want to make sure that they're there and that people can find them so keep it to seven but remember you do have the ability you know ability to use something like the utility nav and get a few more things in there and um, the next is order by importance to the user so make sure again what is the goal of your website what are, what does the user want it Oftentimes people put the about us button first and maybe the user is less worried about who you are and more about your programs or more about your, you know, how to get there or, you know, something like that. So just keep in mind that think in, think in terms of what the user is looking for. Another thing that we talk about frequently is what are the five things that someone needs before acting? So 
our very first item was what is the goal of your website? Let's say your goals are to get donations or to get registrations for your events or to sell your product online or whatever it is. What are the, think about what are the five things? There tend to be about five things that people need to know before they do that. And whether that's you know, what, if it's a donation, what programs they're supporting and who you are and how you spend your resources and how long you've, or how you've helped their community specifically, whatever those items are, make sure that those are easy to find. Also, the, the sort of biggest issue that I see with sites that have been live for a long time, and I run into it with my own, uh, my team is in charge of updating shipple.com, tendency.com, the Shippo blog, the Tendency blog, the SCM blog, you know, kind of all of our properties is that we'll add new content, but we won't necessarily make that new content easy to find. So we may add a new page about a service or we may add a case study or we may add some really fantastic content. But if you, you know, if you missed the the blog post about it the first time, you're not going to be able to go back and find it. So make sure that new content is linked either in your navigation or on a related page or on, you know, in, in a sidebar or something, make sure that new content you add is getting added to your navigation as well. So that is the first part, the first part, your, um, your homepage audit checklist. Again, I've got everybody muted. So if you have any questions, feel free to type in the chat box um, and I'll just keep going through and I'll sort of keep an eye on that to see if you have any questions as we go along. So the second part is content and keywords. When your site has been live for a little while, you want to keep an eye on how the content is performing, how your keywords are performing as far as, you know, what keywords are bringing traffic in through search engines. And a big part of that is Google Analytics. Uh, we install Google Analytics on pretty much every single site that we build. So if you don't have access to your Google Analytics, um, shoot me an email at the end of this and I will make sure you get set up so that you can log into your Google Analytics. The couple of exceptions are usually like if you already had an analytics account and, you know, or something weird like that. But we should have a Google Analytics account already set up for you with content. So if you don't have access, shoot me an email. I'm actually going to close out of my slideshow and flip over to Google Analytics a little bit and show you some examples. So I am on the tendency demo site, Google Analytics right now. So we're looking at just sort of a demo, a demo, um, demo account. And one of the biggest questions I get asked about Google Analytics is, okay, I have access and I can log in, but I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do when I get there. I get there and there's all kinds of, you know, there's, there's too many, there's too many options. So we're going to go through a couple of Google Analytics reports that I think are really important as you're looking through your website. Um, just a side note, uh, the tendency events calendar, if you go to tendency.com slash events, we just added a couple of new training classes today. So if you go there, it will default to today. But if I go forward to June, you'll see another webinar on, there's an intro to content management, there's an intro to Google Analytics, there's an in-person intro to tendency. So there's some other there's some other classes on the calendar now as of today, and there is an intro to Google Analytics class. So if you're interested in learning even more about Google Analytics than I show you today, feel free to register for that and we'll, we'll kind of dive into Google Analytics. So back to Google Analytics. So let's talk about content. So Google Analytics has sort of these tabs on the side under standard reports. We're going to start with content and I'm going to click on overview. So the overview shows you kind of the top pages that were visited in the past month. And by default, you'll see your timeline up here. Your timeline is the last 30 days. You can change that and look at the last quarter, the last year. You can change that to whatever you like. Um, I'm just going to keep it at 30 days for now, kind of while we're, while we're looking at it. So you'll see the top pages, and I can look at the URL. So this is, so this is demo.tendency.com slash dashboard. This is what happens after the URL. I can also switch it to page title if that's easier for me. I have a feeling on this demo site it will not be because we have a lot of test content in here. So I'm going to go back to page view. But if page title is easier for you to kind of review the data, you can view it that way. Um, this one with just the slash, that's the home page. You the, your home page will, in 99% of cases, your home page will be the most visited page on your site. Um, I'm going to click full report. And now I'm looking at a list of all the top content. Uh, it's showing 10 rows. I can expand it out to 25 or 50 or whatever I like. 
Um, a note on your top content is that your top content will probably not change very much from like week to week or month to month. It tends to be very similar across time. So again, your homepage will probably be at the top. There'll probably be a couple of pages like about or contact or your job board or something like that. Those tend to be, you know, they tend to kind of stay in the same order. So looking at this top content, it's important to know what your top content is, but I don't, I wouldn't stress about looking at it once a month or once a week or something like that. I think, um, you know, maybe once a month or once a quarter is, is fine to look at your top content. Unless the caveat there is if you have a new product or a new service or a new event or a new something going on, um, you probably want to keep an eye to see if that content is, is perf- you know, how that's performing and if it's kind of popping up in the top 10 or top 20. So that's how you pull the content report. I'm going to flip back over to my presentation. So you want to look at your top content. What pages are the most, are getting the most traffic? This is actually a restaurant and you can sort of tell that this is a restaurant website because the homepage is number one, then the dinner page is getting a lot of traffic, then brunch, then a tour, then the events. So you can see by looking at the content that the dinner page is getting more traffic than brunch. So when they're sort of focusing their efforts on you know, maybe posting menus or posting information. It looks like the dinner crowd is, uh, you know, more interested. There's more of them than brunch. So you kind of want to look for is, is this what I expected? Is this the order of things like, you know, are these the top pages that I expected to see? If there's some pages that you, you thought would be in the top 10 or 15 or 20 that aren't, then maybe think about probably those pages are are kind of hard to find on your website. Maybe people aren't able to find them, or maybe that content is not quite as valuable as you thought it was. Maybe you really thought that you had a bigger brunch crowd, but really people, you know, you you can kind of look and see, is it what you expected and make decisions, make some changes to your content based on that, especially is it easy to find? It tends to be, if you think your content is important to your visitors, it probably is. It's probably an issue of, can they find it? Do they know it's there? Um, Another quick report I'll show you, I'm going to flip back to Google Analytics, is so over here on the left, you'll see I'm in the content kind of area. I'm in, I'm drilled down into this all pages. If I click the next link, which is content drill down. So this shows me not just the individual page path, but whatever the top level top level directory is. So for instance, in tendency, all of the events pages start with slash event slash something. So if it's an individual event view, it'll be like slash event slash 32 or, you know, whatever. Or if it's a, if it's a month view, everything starts with in tendency, everything within that module starts with the same kind of path. So everything in photos starts with slash photos, everything in jobs starts with slash jobs. So this shows, because it just shows you that top level, you can kind of see which modules are performing better. So Oftentimes, one individual photo may not be outperforming the homepage, but if you lump them all together, then they actually are getting more, even more traffic than your homepage. So this is a good way to see kind of aggregate which modules are people using, which modules are getting traffic, which modules are people um, are people interested. So I have it ordered by page views. And just a quick note on definitions, a page view means that If I went to your site in one day and I went to 10 pages on the site, that's 10 page views. So this is not necessarily individual people, but this is views of that content. Um, Time on page is the amount of time that someone spent on an individual page. Um, Bounce rate means that they got to the page, they got to the page and they didn't see anything. They didn't see anything interesting. They just bounced, they left. They didn't click on anything. They got to the page and they, they left without going any further. So um, that's what this bounce rate percentage. So with bounce rate, the higher it is, the, the the worse it is. I guess the lower it is, the better. You wanna keep your bounce rate. We shoot for keeping our bounce rates under about 50%. And the thinking there is that if, if less than half the time, you know, if on average uh, people, if less than half the time, people are bouncing, that means that more than half the time people are finding something to click on there. They're going somewhere on your site. So if if um, your bounce rate is under 50%, that means that the majority of people on your site are finding something to click on. They keep, they keep clicking and digging into your website. Um, and then exit rate means that that was the last page they visited and then they exited. So it doesn't necessarily, if somebody if I go to your site and I visit three pages, then I exited on the third one. So it's not necessarily 
you know, they're going to leave, sadly, they're going to leave your site eventually. So exit rate is not the worst thing in the world, but this sort of says what percentage of these people was this the last page they went to. So this this page path level is a good um, is a good report as well. And again, the way we got there is under content. We went to content drill down, and then it showed us um, by kind of what that top level, what that first um, part of the URL is. So tendency has its own way of doing that as well, which is called event logs. And the event logs report looks like this. The tendency event log, so an event log is literally a, it's a, it's a, it's something got tracked in the database. So essentially something happened, an event happened. So um, an event can be something like a view or an edit or, um, so if you go to, uh, a, if you add a photo and you add it, then that's an event. If you view it, that's an event. If you edit it, that's an event. So these are sort of hits in the database. So they're not exactly, they're not exactly um, people. So when you're looking at Google Analytics, you're just looking at people viewing your content. An event log shows you a little bit more. Again, it counts things like ads and edits and, and you know, it, it counts a little bit more than just views. So you'll see, so you don't expect these numbers to exactly match what you're seeing in Google Analytics, but you should see the, the numbers and tendency tend to be a lot higher, but because it's counting more than just views. Um, but this shows you, the event log summary shows you kind of activity by module and it's color coded. So the homepage is turquoise, the events module is orange, and you can kind of see on a day by day basis where the, act, what activity is happening on your website. It's color coded by module. The modules are listed below. So you can kind of see, is there a lot of activity to events or photos or pages? And again, this is important because if you're just straight up looking at content lists, you're probably not going to see a single photo show up higher, you know, very high on a list. But if you're looking at something like this, you may see that the photos module as a whole gets more traffic than the homepage. So maybe the photos are more important than you thought, or maybe your jobs board doesn't get as much traffic as you thought and you need to make it either easier to find or try to get more job postings or, or you know, you're sort of checking, checking where the activity is happening. And this report is linked under reports in the admin bar. And it's going to default to the month. So you'll see today is, I pulled this today right before we started. So I had an updated version. It's June and oops, and today is the 27th, so you'll see that the data goes down through to the 27th. So you can always go previous and next and look at the previous month and go back and look at data. But if you, for instance, if you look at it on the first of the month, it will only have one day's worth of data. So just hit previous to look at the, at the last month if it, if it looks kind of weird. So again, what do I do with this data? You want, in all of these things, uh, we're pulling these reports, you kind of want to look at, is it what you expected? Are your top pages what you expected? Um, if you see popular topics that kind of pop up, can you add more content around those popular topics? Because obviously your visitors, you know, your visitors care about those topics. And then for content that is that you think should be on the list, but isn't, can you make that content more findable or more interesting or maybe Maybe there's a page that's really important, but it's just a big block of text. And can you add images or video or something like that so that content is easier to digest? Um, this is an example of shipple.com. And if you look at these top 10 pages on shipple.com, you'll see the home page is all the way down as number five, which is sort of, again, I, like I said, 99% of times your homepage will be at the top. Well, what is above it? These help files. Um, we have a lot of help files on our site that get good traction in search engines. So people organically are typing for, typing in, how do I transfer my old iPad data to my new iPad? And they hit our help file. So that 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 page gets just a ton of traffic. And um, you'll also see things like quotes in here. We have a quotes module that has, we, we just, it's sort of a company culture of knowledge sharing. We like to share cool ideas and cool quotes. So a long, long time ago, before I even came here five years ago, they, we add these quotes to our website. And it's sort of become, again, it's sort of part of our culture. And we get a ton of traffic from these quotes because people, usually because people, again, are searching in search results. They're trying to remember what that exact quote was. And we just happen to come up. So what we've done is we realized, okay, these quotes get a ton of traffic. These people are probably not necessarily going to buy a website because they came to a quote, but how can we make them kind of spend a little more time with our brand? So you'll see a screenshot down here. We added some things to the quotes page. So we added social sharing buttons. So if you like this quote, you can share it on social media. And then that like that shares it so that maybe those people will come back to our website. 
we added tags. So for instance, this Benjamin Franklin quote is tag politics. And we and the system, because it's tag politics, pulls in more quotes with that same tag. So maybe they'll, you know, if this is someone who likes quotes, they'll spend a little more time on the site, they'll read more quotes. So that's an example of kind of decisions we made and changes that we made based on seeing this, um, seeing our top content in the in the site. The next item is the Keyword Density Analyzer, and this is a tool that we created. It's at shipple.com slash SEM hyphen tools. And what this does, I'm actually going to show you a live demo. Flip over. Okay, so you're on shipple.com slash SEM tools, and the first one is this Keyword Density Analyzer. Um, and what this does is it it tries to look at your web page in the same way that a search engine does. So a search engine is deaf and blind. A search engine can't, they can't see your beautiful graphics and your beautiful image and images, and they don't know, um, you know, they just see the content and the code on your site. So what you can do is enter in your URL, and this tool will grab your code and spit out what keywords or what words you're using the most in your content. And that is a good indication of kind of what the search engines think your site is about because, again, because they're deaf and blind, they only see content. Whatever words you use the most, is those are the words that the search engine thinks your, your page is about. So I'm going to run it for triple.com. And it's going to run for just a second. And I might, I might cheat and go back to my uh, presentation. Oh, there it goes. OK. So you should be seeing um, the Shipple Keyword Density Analyzer, which has got a, the URL shipple.com. And then you'll see a whole bunch, a big table with lots of, lots of words. So I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. OK, so the way that this works is it pulls out the most commonly used single words, two word phrases, and three word phrases. And what that means is, when we say keyword, we don't necessarily mean single word. The average Google search is three to five words. People rarely just search web or design. They're going to search something like web design company, you know, and, and you know this by the way that you search. If you type something in and you don't get the results you're looking for, you'll go back and usually change your search and add some more words and get a little more specific. So we know that people are used to kind of searching for somewhat specific um, Phrases. So what, what I tend to do is not really worry too much about the single words because, again, that's sort of, it's not really how people search. It's good to know, but it's not really how people search. So these are the, the two and three word phrases that are most common on your site. So web design, social media, web marketing, uh, media consulting, which is probably the end of social media consulting. Um, read more is funny. A lot of times you'll see a read more, or get info or, you know, something, whatever your call to action is, if you're using it in the same place, a lot of times, sometimes that will pop up. Um, blog development, case studies, uh, over on the three words, social media consulting. So these are things that you kind of want to check and make sure that these top keywords are what you really want the search engines to think your content is about. So I ran this for the homepage. You can run this for any, pa any page within your site. Each page should sort of have its own focus. So each page, if your page is specifically about um, a certain program or a certain service, you know, for instance, our social media consulting page has social media consulting kind of is its focus. So that's just so the words at the top should say something about that, whereas a page about design should have words about design at the top of the list. And each page should kind of have its own focus and its own its own life so that it can be the best answer for the que for the question that someone is searching. So if you run this for your homepage, and I hope you are playing with it right now and running it for your homepage or one of your pages, you should see your brand name in there. Obviously, um, your brand name is you should you will r rank well for your brand name. That is just because you are the again, the search engine's job is to provide the best answer for the question. So your your brand name is something if somebody's looking for your brand name, they're obviously looking for you. You still want to make sure you see it in there just so that it's you know, it's clear it's in there. You should also see your primary service or product. Um, so if your service is, you know, again, we see, we saw web marketing and web design and all that on there because that's kind of our primary service. You should also see your geography if that's applicable. If you're really focused in Houston, you should see the word Houston in that kind of top list so that the search engines know where geographically you're located. That's a really good way to be. So again, part of the reason that we don't we don't want, we don't really care about, or we're not super worried about those one word terms is that 
they're so generic that the competition is crazy, crazy high. And a good way to kind of narrow down that competition and to really be the best answer for their search is if they search something with geography in it. So like this is, um, I believe this is the Children's Museum. They have museum on their, on their website a lot and that's great, but probably people aren't just looking for museum. They're probably looking for Houston Museum or Museum in Houston. So you want to make sure you see the see museum there and that's fantastic, but also Houston because that really helps them be more competitive when someone's searching. So another keyword tool you can use is again in Google Analytics, we can look at what keywords. So earlier in Google Analytics, we looked at what content was bringing in the most traffic. Now we're going to look at what keywords and these keywords are the keywords that people actually searched in Google or any of the search engines. I say Google because Google is sort of Google has about 75% of the market share. So Google is if you can make Google happy, then you sort of got the rest of them covered but um, so that the search these is these are keywords that anyone on any search engine um, are typing in to kind of see what uh, and getting to your website so we're going to flip back over going to google analytics so to get to the keywords we're going to go into traffic sources so think about it as how did people get to your site so we want to go to traffic sources because we're trying to figure out how people got to my site i'm going to go to sources and search and then I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit organic because Google Analytics is smart enough to break down if it was organic search or paid search. Oh, this is actually not a stellar example because this demo site is not really optimized for SEO. Let's go to blog.tenancy.com. Another, a nice thing about Google Analytics, if you're looking at, if you're using multiple accounts like we do, is you'll notice when I switched the account, it kept my report exactly the same. So I'm in the same place. I'm still in the organic search traffic. I'm just now in it for a different account. So this is the tendency blog, and I'm looking at keywords, and you'll see my top keywords are things like open WYSIWYG editor for video, tendency open source vulnerabilities, 10 things for my NPO. So these are kind of funny keywords these, because this is a blog. It's got the keywords are going to be a little um, not quite the same as they would if it was just the, the primary website because the content changes. So, you know, we add all kinds of different content. If you see this not provided, don't worry too much about not provided. Not provided is if you're logged into Google where you have um, what's called a, an SSL, which is a secure connection to Google. And you can see I have it right up here because it says HTTPS. If I search and I have that HTTPS, Google protects my keywords and it doesn't share it. And so that those come through as not provided. We, um, we don't worry too much about those because there's not really a way to, to see what that data is. I just sort of assume that what's happening in this not provided bucket matches kind of what's happening outside of the not provided bucket. So um, that we sort of look at the other words as an example. So that's how you get to this report. And I'm going to show you my screenshot. So this is a screenshot of that report for one of our clients, Miller Outdoor Theater. And you can see what I've done to this list is a good thing to do is you want to look at your top keywords, what keywords are bringing in traffic, but also, it's like as kind of how I mentioned, you will rank well for your name. You should get a lot of traffic for your name because if somebody's looking for your name, they're obviously looking for you. Well, sometimes your name, when you look at your keyword report, it will be all just versions of your name. Like shipple is a funny word. If you're looking for shipple, you're probably looking for us. People spell it wrong. That's fine. And so when we tend to look at our keywords, the top however many will be versions of the word shipple. So a trick you can use is to exclude your brand name, and then that will show you just what we call non-branded terms, which are kind of those more general terms that are people who are might be learning about you for the first time. Not They don't already know who you are. Like, again, Miller Outdoor Theater. You'll see words in here like Outdoor Theater Houston and Herman Park Events and Houston Outdoor Theater and Houston Events and things that are people not necessarily, they didn't already know they were going to Miller. They were, they were, searching for something to do in Houston, and then they, they stumbled upon the website. So non-branded word, non-branded key terms uh, can be very powerful, and that's sort of where you tend to get new visitors, people who didn't know about you before. So you want to look at by traffic. You'll see that this report is sorted by visits, which is what pretty much all the reports we've looked at so far, we've sorted by visits. 
if you set up goals in Google Analytics, and again, if you're not familiar with how to do that, we're, we're doing a Google Intro to Google training in a couple of weeks. Um, if you set up goals in Google Analytics, you can add a secondary filter and look at not just visits, but conversion. So you can see who not only what which of these words not only brought traffic, but then actually converted. And when I say conversion, when you set up a conversion in Google An Analytics, that tends to be something like a contact form or a donation form or some kind of form where we can say, you know, if someone made it through these steps and then they hit the confirmation page, I know that they converted. I know they contacted us. I know they submitted a donation. I know that they did they did what I wanted them to do. So you can set up those conversions in Google Analytics, and then it adds another an additional filter where any of these reports you can look at, not just traffic, but conversions. So again, you want to look, does it match kind of what you were thinking? Look for surprises. I mentioned in the tendency blog report we looked at, there were some that were sort of odd that you maybe wouldn't expect to get traffic from. You know, look for something that you don't expect, and then either create either decide you know is this applicable to me you know is this something that i do i do want to get traffic from i do i do think that this is interesting even though it's a surprise if that's the case then maybe add more content around that subject if it's something that's like totally random and wonky then it's okay to you know you can sort of figure out which maybe which piece of content is bringing in traffic for that word but um yeah if it's something that's interesting and, and pertinent to your brand even if it's kind of it's kind of um Tan tangential <laughs> to your branding um, and go ahead and think about ways you can capitalize on that, add more content around that topic and see if you can get even more traffic for those kinds of keywords. So again, what do I do with this data? What keywords are missing? Can you add content around those topics? What keywords are sticking? What new keywords are emerging? Uh, this is an example of Chimp Haven, and they do, they're an animal shelter for chimpanzees out in Louisiana. And you'll see, if you look at their top keywords, you'll see Chimp Haven, Chimp, ha Chimp Haven Shreveport, Chimpanzee Facts, um, some of their staff members. Well, you'll see one up here, careers with a primatology degree. So there are people who are looking for careers with to work with primates and that are kind of stumbling upon their website. So what they've done is they said, oh, this could be, you know, people, we could use the website as a recruiting tool. Maybe that's something they hadn't thought of before. Um, and so they've added some content around some videos like why Chimp Haven staff members care about chimps and sort of highlighting their staff members and talking about their career opportunities. And maybe that's something that they hadn't thought of using the website for before, but they're kind of seeing where the keywords then drove some of the content happening on the site. And if you're brainstorming content, let's say you have some keywords that you're that either you saw pop up that you add, want to add more content around, or maybe you're thinking, well, what about this keyword that I, I really think we should be ranking for that we're not? Um, the best way to rank for a keyword is to add content specifically around that keyword. So if you're if there's a word that you're not seeing, and when you're you know you're looking at all this data, you're, there's a hole that's missing. The best thing you can do is add content around those keywords. So here are some content brainstorming ideas. I put up the GNA Partners blog. They do HR outsourcing, and they have a great blog about HR. They post things like fun infographics, and they do this series down here called Hiring Horror Stories. And this was actually something that started a few years ago where they, for kind of for Halloween, for a fun thing, they got together and they put a list of kind of funny hiring horror stories, and they got so much traffic that they do it every single year. And they do sometimes, you know, two posts a year and they have people who will send them these funny stories because it's just such a it's a just kind of a fun popular topic and so sometimes you'll have content like that that kind of takes on a life of its own um so anytime you can do people love love top 10 lists top 10 ways to do this top 13 you know resources about this if you can piggyback off of any hot topics or anything that's in the news, if there's something that is really pertinent to your brand that's applicable that you can, you know, people are searching for and talking about some news item, if you can, if you can piggyback off of that a little bit and talk about how it relates to your audience, that's, that's a good way to get traffic. Um, infographics, people love infographics, people love visual content. Visual content is really easy to share and digest on social media and things like that. So anytime you can share, even if like I mentioned with GNA, sometimes they share other people's infographics. A lot of people who create infographics are 
um, they do it so that you'll share them. So as long as you kind of credit back and link back to those people, you can, you're allowed to post that content. So, you know, your, your mileage may vary. Double check if you find an infographic you like a lot, but you'll probably have no problem posting it and linking back to the original source and kind of, you know, repurposing that infographic. Also, how-tos or FAQs. This is something that works really well for if you have a, a an organization or if you have um, an industry that's maybe not so not as sexy or not as like you know people aren't making infographics about us. Well, I guarantee that within your sector, within the people who work in your industry, there are certain frequently asked questions that you run across all the time. And can you be the resource for those frequently asked questions? Can you provide how tos or can you provide content that? Uh, you know, that you know people in your specific industry really care about. And maybe that audience is a smaller audience, but I guarantee you if you can speak directly to them, then that will keep them kind of coming back for more. Uh, another another sort of trick with content is tagging people. So um, if you tag someone, let's say you go to an event and you see someone speak or you post photos and you can kind of tag the people in it and share then it sort of gives you, it gives them a reason to share your content. So for instance, when we go to networking luncheons, a lot of time there'll be a speaker. So we'll come back and write a blog post about that speaker, sort of recap the session, post a couple of pictures, and then maybe shoot them a Facebook message or on Twitter or say, hey, we, you know, we recap this session with so-and-so and almost every single time the speaker will then share our content. So it's sort of a nice way if you have either an, an event or if you have a customer that you can talk about that makes sense or someone, you know, where you can sort of talk about other people and um, then they are, it makes them feel good because you're talking about them. It also, they're probably going to share your content. Karma makes the internet go round. So anytime you can sort of showcase other people and other people's work, they're probably going to share, go turn around and share that content. Also, anytime you can talk about local, I mentioned geography before you, you know, you, may not be, it, it may be pretty difficult to be, to rank, you know, number one for a certain keyword in general. But if you add your specific geography, you know, add Houston or add Texas or add San Francisco or add whatever to the end of it, then maybe it's a lot more likely that you will be number one for that keyword. So adding local content is always good. And then again, revisiting and updating popular content. I mentioned the hire, hiring horror stories. Every year they revisit that topic. Um, if you have a page that you just see is in your top content and people love going to it, can you, can you add something else to that conversation? Can you add that content in an interesting way? Can you create a video around that topic? Or you know, can you, can you revisit that content since obviously that's content that people are interested in? And then why content creates credibility. This is a study from uh, Stanford, which is a, it's um, a credibility study. And essentially what they did, and this is specifically sort of talking to nonprofits. We work with a lot of nonprofits. Um, so Stanford did a usability study and they said, for each of these different types of websites, what do you care about? Or what, what makes you trust them? What makes you trust the website? They surveyed tons and tons of people. Um, you'll see the example or the graph on the left is about design. So the red bar is sort of the average for all sites. So for all sites, 46% of people said the design, you know, the design makes me trust a site. It makes it feel credible. The better the design is, the more credible. Um, for nonprofits, you'll actually see that they're one of the lower um, the lower categories on the scale. For nonprofit websites, only 39% of people, so still a pretty high number, but less than average, people cared less about the design when it came to credibility. But on the right example, you'll see percent of comments related to company motive. So for, again, the red line is sort of the average. For all sites in general, 15% of people said, I really care about the company motive that, you know, that makes a site feel credible to me. For nonprofits, that number was at the highest. That number was 20%. So that number was, you know, a third higher where people said, for nonprofits, I really do care about the company motive. And this is all just to show that design is, you know, we obviously love design and we love creating cool, interesting interesting graphics and that kind of thing. But um, at the end of the day, people do 
for nonprofits care a little bit less about design and a little bit more about the company motive and what is behind the organization. And so content is a great way to show off who you are, your motives, show off how you spend your resources, the kinds of people that you help, testimonials of the, you know, the organizations that you that you partner with, you know, for, especially for nonprofits, content really does create credibility. And for all for all websites, but especially nonprofits. Um, if you're interested in reading more about that, there is a blog post on tendency.com. We actually spoke at this year's nonprofit technology conference on Increase or level up your un- online fundraising. And we talked a lot about building credibility online through your content, through your images, things like that. So if you're interested in reading more about that, quick plug, there's a blog post where you can you can learn more. Okay, so we've gotten through sort of analyzing what your content's doing now, what kind of keywords are happening now, some ways to, um, some content strategy around what kinds of content can you create that people will share and that people will kind of link to and some interesting content. Now we're going to talk some just a couple of specifics on how to incorporate keywords into your content. So when you looked at your keyword list, I'm sure there were a couple of keywords that were not on there that you're thinking, okay, I need to start, in, you know, I, I need to rank better for these these keywords. Or I wish I was getting more traffic for keywords around this topic. Well, again, the best way that you can rank well for a keyword is to create content around that keyword. And maybe you already have content, but those keywords just aren't really integrated into the content. So the search engines don't quite know that that's what the page is about. Um, here are a couple of places in Tendency that you can incorporate keywords into your content. There's a separate webinar on SlideShare that was done by Jenny Lane that is about optimizing your Tendency site for SEO. And this is a really fantastic webinar. You'll see the link down there at the bottom on uh, Tendency has a lot of search engine optimization built in out of the box. So as soon as you open, you know, as soon as you launch your website, there's SEO that sort of baked into the code already, but you also have the ability to customize a lot of your SEO and a lot of your keywords and a lot of that kind of thing. So this presentation kind of walks through what's baked in, what can you customize, kind of some tips for that, how to update the title tag, the meta, the content text, um, adding alt tags on images, how to, you know, making sure that if you're using photo and video, you fill out the entire description and you've got real words in there because again, search engines are deaf and blind. So if you have photos about a certain topic, you have to put a text description that kind of tells the search engine what it's what it's looking at. And um, so this presentation is a really fantastic resource for some specifics and tendency for incorporating keywords into your content. Okay, so we are in part three. And this is analytics benchmarks. So we're going to talk about some benchmarks. We're going to talk about some, we're going to talk about some specific metrics that we use to sort of, um, sort of determine how our websites are doing. And and, and hopefully this will help you kind of compare yourself against similar websites. You know, benchmarks are, again, an average. Every website's a little bit different, but maybe this will give you an idea of how your website's performing. So when you're looking at Google Analytics, the first thing you'll see when you look at that data is traffic. So you, we saw the blue bar when we first logged in of kind of the last 30 days, how's traffic been? When you look at traffic, you, and I mentioned it's going to default to the last month, you want to look at uh, this month compared to last month. You want to keep an eye on how your traffic is performing over time. But you also want to remember that there are seasonal trends that happen every single year. So this example up here, this is three years worth of data for one of our festival clients. They have their festival in the summertime every single year. You can see every single year, there's a big ramp up, there's weekend one, weekend two, and then kind of a ramp down. Then a ramp up, weekend one, weekend two, and then it goes down. So if you're looking at, you know, if you're big, if your biggest time of year is December where you get the most donations and you're looking at January versus December, well, that's not ever really going to be fair because you know that December is the most, you get the most donations. So you want to look at month over month, but also keep in mind year over year traffic. Your What's happening offline should match what's happening online. So if, you know, if your office, maybe you're the opposite in the month of December, you can't get a hold of everybody's on vacation and you don't hear from anybody. Well, then your website traffic will probably reflect that as well. So kind of keep an eye on what's happening offline and expect that to happen online as well. Um, You also want to get in the habit of adding notes, and I'll show you how to do that. So I'm back in Google Analytics. 
I am back on the blog and I actually have a note. Let's see what note can we add? Oh, we added images to our, we, we updated the tenancy homepage just a little bit last week. So what I'm going to do is again, it's defaulted to the last 30 days. I see all my blue dots, one for each day. I'm going to hit this little arrow underneath the graph and you'll see it's got annotations. This is called annotations and I'm going to click create new annotation. I'm going to change the date to last week on Wednesday, which is when this rolled out. And I'm going to say homepage updated with a featured image. So we made it so that the featured image shows for each post. And then I tend to put my initials because I work in an organization where lots of people are logging in. So then they know who added it. If it's just, you know, you and a couple of other people, you may not need to do this. But I like to put my initials just so they know who added it. And then your visibility is either shared, which means anybody who logs into this account can see it. Or if it's something that's private to you, you don't really want to share it. It's just kind of a, a personal note you can say private. So I'm going to click Save. And now you'll see this little, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a little like bubble speaker icon thing right here. So now if I click on that, from this day forward, anytime I click on that, it will pop out my annotation, say on June 19th, homepage updated with featured image. I can tell that that's what happened on that day. And the reason that that's important is we will add things like we sent out a big email blast or we updated the homepage or we, um, you know, added a lot of new content, anything that's kind of big enough that you think it might affect your traffic, you should add an annotation because that way if you're going through and you're looking at this month versus last, last month, you don't have to remember what day was it that we sent out that big email newsletter blast and we got all that traffic. You can just add these little annotations and it will kind of help you remember and keep keep tabs on what was happening in your in your uh, on your website. So if you're adding a bunch of content, making a lot of changes, just get in the habit of kind of adding these little notes to remind yourself because those anytime you make a big change on your website, that should affect your traffic for better, for worse. And so um, that way you can kind of get a good picture of and when you're looking at month over month, what was happening in that month. So the next slide is engagement benchmarks. Engagement benchmarks, I just wanted to, um, we I sort of defined these earlier that average visit duration is the amount of time they spend on your site. We talked about bounce rate, which again, if they get to your site, they don't see anything interesting. They bounce, they leave, they don't click. That's a bounce rate pages per visit, the number of pages that the average person goes to whenever they visit your site. Uh, the percent of new visits is kind of a funny one because you want to take this a little bit with a grain of salt because every time Google Analytics sees a different browser for the first time, it counts them as new. So if I go to your website in Safari, in Firefox, in Chrome, if I'm on my work computer or my phone or my iPad or my personal computer, every time I hit your site for the first time, I get counted as new, even though it's because there's no way for analytics to know that those are all, you know, Caitlin, they just know that it's a new browser. So if you see this percent of new visits, it, you should sort of compare it against itself, but know that it's not exactly 67.89% of human beings have never seen your site before who are visiting, you know, it's, it's, there's a percent of people where analytics has not seen their browser before. So just some benchmarks for you. And I mentioned this earlier, you want your bounce rate to be under 50%, which means that the the reverse, the, the people that actually clicked on something, you know, they got there, they saw something interesting, they clicked. That means that that number is greater than 50%. So on average, someone goes to another page and they find, you know, they see something interesting and they click through to another page. Similarly, you want your pages per visit to be greater than two. And the reason for that is you want on average people to, they'll probably come in through your homepage and you want to at least have you know, you want your site to be at least interesting enough that they wanted to click on one other page. So two is a good number, two and a half or three is better, um, but you want to keep, you know, these are some sort of benchmarks to keep an eye on that your pages per visit, that's that people, that's sort of how, how deep into your site they're exploring. You want to make sure that they at least go to more than one page. And if, you know, if you can get to, to three, that's even better. Some traffic sources benchmarks. When you go into Google Analytics, um, Google Analytics breaks your traffic down into three types. There's uh, search traffic, which means they came in from a search engine. Referral traffic means they clicked from a link on another website. And direct traffic means they hit your site directly. You know, they typed in shipple.com or tenancy.com or yoursite.com. They knew exactly where they were going. So 
because direct traffic, they know who you are and referral traffic, they've sort of, someone else has vouched for them. Uh, we like to see search traffic be the highest piece of this pie because those tend to be new people who may or may not know who you are. They're, they sort of stumbled upon your website. We like to see that number at 60 to 75%. So that's kind of where we like to see, like to see our clients. Again, every website's a little bit different. Um, sometimes I'll show the example of one of our politician clients had a billboard up. And during the months when her billboard was up, her direct traffic was super high because a lot of people would see her on the billboard and type in her URL directly, count as direct traffic. So, you know, kind of depending on what your offline what your offline marketing is looking like. You know, if you're doing TV commercials, then probably people are either typing in your name directly or I think 30%, 30 to 35% of people when they see a TV commercial, the next thing they do is go to Google and search. So, you know, you may see your search traffic go up a little bit. So kind of keep an eye on it. it and again, things that you're doing offline will affect this as well. And then within referral traffic, you can click in and see exactly which websites are referring traffic to you. So kind of keep an eye on that. Is that, again, is that what you expected? Is there maybe there's a media link where someone linked to you in a, in a story that you didn't know about that you can then go kind of follow up on? That's a, that's a good place to keep an eye on as well. So we've just got a couple more sections to go. We're about an hour in, so um, we've got probably another another 15 minutes or so to go in. We're gonna we're gonna talk mobile, and then we're gonna talk some specific tendency features, and then um, we'll I'll open it up for Q and A, and that will be um, we just have a little bit more to go. So first, let's talk mobile benchmarks. Our nonprofit clients, and again, we work with a lot of nonprofit clients, so that's kind of the the stats that we have for for now. I would like to expand and you know get some more benchmarks for you, but for now, I'm going to share what I have. Our nonprofit clients have seen about a 30% increase in mobile traffic from 2013 versus 2012. So what does that mean? So when you're in Google Analytics, you can actually look at your mobile traffic, and let's I'll show you how to do that. So I'm going to go to, we spent a lot of time in the traffic sources area. I'm going to go into audience. I'm going to click on mobile and I'm going to click on overview. So you'll see it down here. There's this yes, no, yes, people. Again, we're on the tendency blog, so this is maybe not the best example, but just to show you kind of how to navigate to this report. Um, so by default, if I click on mobile, it's going to show me yes, no, uh, which is not particularly helpful. I want to see just yes, just who's who's coming to my site from a mobile device. So I'm going to click devices. Okay, so now I get the, at the top of this list, the aggregate number, this 39, that's the number of visits last month from a mobile device. And that number is fine and that's cool. Um, the big thing I'm looking at is this percent of total right here, which I've kind of highlighted. This number shows me what percentage of my total traffic came to my site from a mobile device. And you'll see the tendency blog is at just over 10%. So about 10% of our traffic comes from a mobile device. Um, let me flip back over. For our nonprofit clients, this third bullet right here averaged about 27% mobile traffic. So what we did is we surveyed, um, again, we have... When we, whenever we set up a site, we add Google Analytics, so we have access to a whole bunch of sites. There are about 100 sites we pulled from, and we looked at what the what the average mobile traffic was for just nonprofit clients. And so for them, it was about 27% in the first quarter of 2013. So if you're seeing that number, then that's probably about average. If you're seeing much higher than that, then you're above average. If you're looking at all of the traffic across all of the web, about 13% of all web traffic is mobile. So if you are a B2B organization or um, uh, an organization or B2C, or, you know, if you're selling a product or service to consumers, or if you're a health clinic or something like that, then the 13% is probably more like what you're going to see. But again, for us, we're sort of seeing a, a, a lot higher than that, actually, about double that for nonprofits. Um, an interesting thing about that is it used to be, again, so 30% increase over time. And so we're seeing that increase pretty dramatically. This is a sort of a scary statistic. This is from Google. They have a really great resource called the Mobile Playbook. And it's just the mobileplaybook.com from Google about kind of mobile best practices and standards and that kind of thing. And this stat says 57% of users say they won't recommend a business with a poor performing mobile site. So this is kind of... Um, again, that's sort of a scary stat if you are, if your mobile web, you want to make sure that at a baseline, your website functions on a mobile device. So kind of play with it on 
on an iPhone, borrow someone's Android or iPad and, and test it and make sure that it's at least functioning on a mobile site. If you have additional um, additional resources or additional, you know, again, maybe if you're if your number is a lot higher than than this 27, or if your number is a lot higher than this 13, maybe you want to consider a mobile website that does have an additional cost. That's something that we do for clients. It's an additional cost. It is maybe something you want to consider if you have a, a high amount of mobile traffic. Um, just an, another note on mobile. I think a misconception about mobile is that. People think that mobile users just want a super simplified version of the website. In our experience, mobile users want the same experience. They want the same website or, you know, they want access to all the content. They, it's not that they just want the about page and directions. You know, they really do want all the content. And this um, screenshot right here is from Google Analytics. This is a website where you'll see, and I've got it, I've got a secondary dimension added for operating system. So what this is showing is, if I look at, let me just just pretend like you only see the Windows one. So people who are using Windows on a desktop, what pages do they view in what order? They go to the home page, they go to find camp, then what's happening? Now let's pretend somebody's on an iPhone or an iPad, and we'll, we'll, we're just going to look at the iOS guys. So what what order? You know what pages are most popular within that? The home page, what's happening? Directories, find camp. It's the same. It's the same pages. So whether they're on a phone, whether they're on an iPad, whether they're on a desktop, they are looking at the same pages. They're spending time on the same content. And so, kind of what we and this mirrors our experience that mobile users want. They want to see everything. They don't just want a super simplified version. They want. They it. There's a stat from Nielsen that says that more mobile devices will be connected to the web than desktops in as soon as 2014. So I just I think that there is no mobile web. There's just the web. And so um, that's kind of a misconception about mobile that we found, especially and this is this is changing. You know, this is new. This is in the last year. We've seen that people really do want everything on their on their mobile um, and some other stats in here. 85% of mobile users say they watch TV with their devices. So these are not necessarily people on the go in the car. You know, obviously there's a, there's a big portion of that, but a lot of times people are sitting on their couch watching TV and also kind of playing with their iPad or playing with their phone or playing with, you know, something like that. Also, Google is starting to reward mobile content in mobile search results. So if your content is mobile friendly, if it's mobile optimized, you're a little more likely to get shown in search results um, on a mobile device. So we're just going to talk briefly. Let's say you are thinking about a mobile site or maybe that's something you want to consider. We're just going to talk briefly about two options for how that kind of works. There are two ways that you can set up a mobile site. There is an there is a separate mobile site. So this is the YMCA of Houston. We did this the screenshot on the left is their tendency website. The screenshot on the right is not tendency. It's a separate they use one called HH page that I think they're really happy with. So if you're considering looking, check them out. Um, and the way that they do it is if you go to ymca.org on your phone, you'll see the domain changes. And the domain changes to m.ymcahouston.org. It actually flips you to a completely separate site with completely separate content um, instead of instead of the, the regular site. And I think at the bottom there's a link that says like view full site, but I'm sure you've all seen this. You go on a website, you can tell that it's a separate site for the most part because the URL will change. And this is actually, so this is actually a different site. Um, the other the other way that you can kind of do mobile is a responsive design. This is what we recommend. This is sort of Google's recommended best practice. And the way that responsive design works is instead of using so the in the first example, when you go to the website on your phone, the website there's a little piece of code that says, "Oh, I can tell you're on a mobile device. I'm going to show you this other website. I'm not going to show you the main website. I'm going to show you another website." And it's device specific where it says, you know, I can tell you're on a mobile device. I can tell you're on a tablet. I can tell, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a little snippet of code kind of for each device. So for responsive design, it's, we prefer responsive design again, because Google recommends it because it is more scalable because it doesn't depend on the device. So what this does is it actually serves you the same website based on what, based on what um, size your, in your screen is. So I'm, I'm going to show you an example because it's easier to show it than talk about it. So we're going to go to, let's use, let's use the demo site. So I'm at demo.tendency.com. 
And again, this is the site that we were looking at analytics for earlier. If you ever want to play with tendency, if you're getting, you know, if you're playing with new features, you can go to demo.tendency.com and here's the login and password. You can log in and kind of play with some of the features and um, you're not going to break anything. Every night we reset the site and we reset the database. So you're not going to break anything. If you want to play with a new feature or kind of get to know tendency, this is a great resource, but it also happens to have a responsive design on it. So you'll see that this is my full window and I'm going to take my cursor and I'm going to drag the window so it's smaller. And you'll see in just a second, something will happen there. there oh, let's refresh it. There we go. So when I drag it, you'll see that the design actually changes based on the size of the browser. This one's kind of funny because it looks like we've been people have been messing with it. So you can see that the the brow based on the browser size, the content changes. And when I get small, when I'm sort of in when I'm in mobile view, you can see that the um, the navigation it makes it mobile friendly. So I'm not the, my URL never changed. It's just based on the size of my browser, the content changes. Let's look at a live site that's got a little bit prettier. So this is tendency.com. You'll see when I start to, there you go. When I start to get into like tablet size, some of the content simplifies, my buttons get smaller, my navigation changed to this um, uh, drop down bar. So if I was on my phone, I could click on this and it would show me all my options. You'll see that like, this big image went away once it got too too small. So that's responsive design. So we can set up the design so that, you know, no matter what width, no matter what, it's, um, there it goes. Oop. It's sort of scalable. The Children's Museum does this, cmhhouston.com. We also have a case study about it on tendency.com, kind of about how we set it up and some of the stats we've seen and some of the improvements on their analytics based on their responsive design. So what are the what are the advantages of each of these two options? Um, they I mentioned that they both they both um, they have development costs to them. The separate mobile site the the biggest advantage of a separate mobile site is the cost if you're adding on to an existing site. So a lot of times if your site is already built and already created, adding um, adding a separate mobile site with a separate you know it's a completely separate site. It doesn't have to integrate with your current site. It can just sort of be separate. That's Part of the reason why the YMCA started that is, uh, for instance, if you're using Tendency 4, Tendency 4 is not set up. It's not um, the newest version of Tendency is Tendency 5. Tendency 4 is on an older platform. It doesn't really support responsive. It doesn't really play nice with responsive design. So, if, you know, if you're using a T4 site, then maybe if you want to consider a mobile site, a separate mobile site is the way to go. Um, the dis biggest disadvantage is that it's two separate sites. They're completely separate, which means you have to keep them updated. So if you need to change, you know, the hours that you're open on Monday, you have to remember to go and change them in two separate places. Also, it's two sites for search engines to call crawl. That's part of why Google recommends the other way. Um, responsive design. There's more programming required because, again, you have to sort of account for every element on every page because you're not creating a separate site and saying this content is just for mobile. You're using all of your content, which is kind of, you know, that's what we know mobile viewers want, but that takes more programming, that takes more cost. It's recommended by Google, and the big, another big advantage is that um, you, can, you update content only in one place. You don't have to remember to keep updating content in several different places. So the last part we're going to talk about is tendency features. And these are features that I find that clients, so tendency, tendency is open source, which means that we are, um, there's, there's core code that our dev development team and potentially any developer can add and make kind of make changes to. Obviously, if another developer makes a change, they have to kind of propose it and we have to accept it. And, you know, but we have the ability, it's getting updated all the time. So we're always rolling out new features, new, um, whether they're small settings, whether they're big features, we're always rolling out new things. Um, we push out updates about every, every week or so, every week or two, you know, we're always pushing new things out. And like I said, some of them may be small little fixes that you maybe you wouldn't notice, but um, these are some newer features that people may not be using that I like to kind of talk about just to make sure you're using all of the latest features. Um, the first is rich media. The photos module has been in tendency pretty much since the beginning. So it's not necessarily a new feature, but it's something I think that's underrated. Um, the photos module 
The great thing about rich media is that you've seen the whole world, all of the content on the internet is going so visual. That's why networks like Instagram and Vine and Pinterest are so, they're so, you know, new and exciting and growing like crazy because they're so visual. So the tendency photos module allows you to kind of visually tell your story about your organization. If you're not using the videos, I mean the photos module, I highly recommend it. You'll see a little screenshot here. This is that report we looked at earlier, earlier where um, the, the page level, the photos tend to, photos often even outweigh the homepage if you look at them all together. So photos are extremely, extremely powerful. Um, the videos module is something that is new-ish. It's been in, uh, if your site went live older than about a year or two, a year and a half ago, that you may not um, be using the videos module. The videos module allows you to add, similar to the photos module, you can add videos to your site and it creates a gallery. You want to, if you're using rich media, make sure that you have, you're adding unique titles and descriptions to your content. Again, so it can get searched, but photos and videos module, there are lots of great resources if you go to tendency.com slash help on how to use those. Um, a lot of the new updates we've been putting on tendency.com are reports. There is things like membership reports, top spenders, which shows you who is spending the most, um, you know, who's often it's donations, you know, who's donating the most or who's spending the most money on um, event registrations, you know, who's spending the most on your site. The invoices report is cool and new. Um, if you go to, let's flip over to one. You see, da, da, da. so I'm in the demo site. I'm going to go to reports and invoice reports. It's the very first one. So essentially what you can do is you can create a report that shows you all of the, in, an invoice is the way that tendency catalogs any money spent on your site. So if you are, if they're memberships or events or donations or, you know, anything. So I can go and I can say, you know, which kinds of invoices do you want me to include? Let's say, well, we'll do all of them. And then you can say, you know, only show me tendered ones or estimates means like if somebody filled out a form, but they didn't actually, their credit card got declined or something like that, it'll show up as an estimate. Um, let's see only tender, just ones that only went through. So I can show and I can run this report and I can pick my date range. Let's see. I don't know. This is the demo site again. So we'll see if anything shows up. And it's running. Okay. So while the, while the report's running, it's actually going to, it's kind of running in the background and you'll see it kind of resetting itself. Um, you'll see it kind of reloading. And what that's doing is it's running in the, the report's running in the background, but um, you're kind of sitting on this page. And you can actually leave this page while the report runs. And when, you'll see the result show up once it's done. I'm going to cheat and go to one that we've already created. Let's go to this one. Oops, I clicked on the wrong. Yeah. Is it going? Let's see. Again, this is the demo site, so maybe I should have picked a better example. Let's see, it's spinning. Oh, here we go. Well, let me pull up my backup. So what you can see here is this back report. That is an, that is the invoices report. So it will look something like this, and it will show you the number of invoices, the total amount that went through, um, balance is open balance. So again, if someone's credit card got declined or they didn't finish the 
you know, they didn't go all the way through or something like that. Um, but payments, $11,991 in this example is the number, that's the amount of money that has kind of been processed on the website. And then it breaks it down into, you can look at just event, you know, just invoices from events, from custom forms, from just the plain payments module. And you can go look and see kind of where you're, where the money that's coming through on your site, how much money is coming through on your site um, and kind of where it's coming from. So that's a very cool report. Um, the next thing, the next um, feature that we've added really recently, this was actually rolled, we announced it yesterday. So this is kind of a sneak peek. It will be rolling out within the next, starting on Monday. When you very first log into Tendency, right now you're used to seeing a dashboard with icons and the icons show you all of the Tendency modules and you can click on them to kind of get to the modules. Well, our idea for the dashboard is to have it be more like a console where it shows you top metrics from your site. So starting next week, when you log into the site, you'll see instead of those icons, you'll see the um, uh, you'll see different dashlets and different content that is either like the top forms or the top member, you know, member data. You'll see kind of stats for new members, pending members in the last 30, you know, how many are going to expire in the next 30 days. Um, you'll see. And so if you go to the blog, blog.tendency.com, there, the most recent post is kind of about the dashboard. It shows lots of screenshots on how it will work, how to customize it, how to, how to, how to, um, to update your dashboard information. So the dashboard is a very cool thing that we're really excited about. I see a couple of you are chatting that you're having audio issues, and I'm not quite sure. We're at the end, so I'm going to, um, I guess, wrap it up. The if you're to keep up to date with the new features of what's going on, follow blog.tendency.com. Sign up for the Tendency newsletter at tendency.com/newsletter. That's kind of where we push out what these updates are happening. Um, and then I've got some other resources, tendency.com slash events. Again, our upcoming events calendar. I am, I'm gonna, um, this is, this is the end. This is the question slide. I know some of you are having audio issues. I'm gonna, I'm going to post these, post this video. So hopefully you'll be able to, um, maybe, maybe hear the end a little bit better if you're, if you're having some audio issues, but, um, thanks everyone. We're at about an hour and a half. So, um, I'm going to to wrap it up. If you have any questions, feel free to type in the chat box. I'll start unmuting everybody in just a, just a second. Um, or if you are, if you need to drop off and be done, that's totally cool. Um, thank you for joining me. Again, I'll post the video. I'll post the slides so you'll have all the content. So if you're having audio issues towards the end, hopefully you can hopefully you can can get that last bit of information. So um, that is all for me. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to to type them in. I'm going to start unmuting everybody and uh, have a have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. I will I will talk to you. See you guys. See you guys soon. Hopefully on our next webinar.